From the mouth of the River Tees and the rugged coast of the North Sea, this programme takes us through spectacular scenery. With the splendour of the Esk Valley and the dramatic climb into the North Yorkshire Moors, it becomes one of the great British railway journeys. Cleveland and North Yorkshire, where the sea meets the moors. Starting in Middlesbrough, we explore the three railway lines which serve this popular holiday area. The Heritage Line, the Esk Valley Line and the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. The mouth of the River Tees is dominated by the docks, warehouses and factories of Middlesbrough. Once this was a small farming community. Then ironstone and coal were brought together to create the iron and steel industry. In just a few years, Middlesbrough grew into an industrial metropolis with some of the most advanced technology in the world. The railway to Middlesbrough was an extension of the Stockton and Darlington, the world's first public railway to use steam locomotives. This opened in 1825 and arrived at the new port of Middlesbrough in 1830. Locomotion, the railway's first locomotive, is on display at the Darlington Railway Museum. She was built by the famous engineers Robert Stevenson and Company. George Stevenson drove her himself on the opening day. From these small beginnings, the British railway network rapidly grew outwards until the whole country echoed to the sound of steam. The new industrial settlement of Middlesbrough was built as a model town, the first of its kind. The relatively small scale of public buildings such as the old town hall and the customs house are an indication of the modesty of the founders' expectations. Within ten years, the town had reached its planned size and was still expanding. When iron ore was discovered in the nearby hills, the old town burst at the seams and the hub of activity slowly moved southwards. By 1870, Middlesbrough produced over a third of the country's iron. The steel industry created even more growth and the new commercial center grew up away from the river. Through the heart of all this runs the Tees, a mighty river which could not be bridged for many years because of the clearance required for shipping. In 1911, the solution was provided by the Transporter Bridge, Middlesbrough's most prominent landmark and symbol of the town's engineering prowess. A hanging road carries vehicles across the river and today it's the only operational bridge of its type in Britain. Middlesbrough's new station was opened in 1877 by the North Eastern Railway. From here, frequent Sprinter and Express trains depart on the Heritage Line to Saltburn. Following the Tees to the sea, the line passes through Grangemouth, 
where there are vast chemical plants and one of the largest steel complexes in Europe. In the summer, there are tours of the iron and steel works. This bulk terminal with its deep water jetty is the first stage in the production process. Here, bulk carriers bring material from all over the world. Blended ores together with coke and fluxes are stored in this massive stockyard, ready for iron making. The ingredients are taken to the sinter plant and passed beneath an ignition hood. A rich cake called sinter is produced. Coke, another basic ingredient for iron making, is made at coking plants at South Bank and Redcar. The finished coke and sinter come together at the blast furnace. The Redcar furnace is the largest in Europe capable of handling 10,000 tons of molten iron a day. Temperatures reach over 2,000 degrees. Molten iron sinks to the bottom, leaving the slag to float to the top. Iron flows continually from the base of the furnace and is collected in torpedo ladles which are carried to Lackenby for the next stage of the production process, steel making. Steel scrap and molten iron are poured into large steel making vessels. Pure oxygen is blown into the vessel at enormous pressure and this reacts with the unwanted elements. Alloying materials are added to further refine the steel. Molten steel is poured into copper moulds and is drawn from the bottom in a process called continuous casting. It's then cut into length with oxypropane burners. The final stage is rolling in one of the four main mills on the Teesside plant. Hot steel passes through a series of work rollers until it reaches the correct size and shape. Much of the finished product is then carried away by rail. Continuing along the heritage line, we soon come to Red Car. Once a tiny fishing village, Red Car grew rapidly when the railway arrived in 1846. Holidaymakers came to enjoy its golden sands and share the front with the inshore boats or cobbles of the fishermen. Red Car has a museum devoted to the oldest lifeboat in the world. She's now retired, but during her long career, the Zetland saved over 500 lives. This lifeboat came to Red Car on the 7th of October, 1802. The people of Red Car paid £200 for it, and it's been here ever since. Uh, one rescue was in 1854, a ship went aground on the rocks out of here. 
While they were out there, the wind got up, the sea got up, everything got up. Nine crew of the ship, 26 fishermen were out there, 17 men manned this lifeboat that day, and they all came back to shore in one go. 52 men in this boat. Red car headed share of historic buildings, but the most interesting are found a few miles beyond the town at Kirkleatham. Sir William Turner's hospital was built in the reign of King Charles II to provide almshouses for the poor. A Georgian chapel was added later. The old hall at Kirkleatham is now a museum of local history. Kirkleatham village is also home to a bird of prey center with a special emphasis on owls. There are many species of these magnificent birds, from great horned owls to barn owls. The large eagle owl is from mainland Europe. Tawny owls are common all over Britain, while the snowy owl is found only in the extreme north. There are also a few other birds of prey. In order to show the birds at their best, there are regular flying demonstrations. From Redcar, the line follows the sea through Musk and Longbeck before reaching the clifftop town of Saltburn. Saltburn is about 800 years old in the early town was clustered around the ship inn beneath Cat Nab, a large mound of boulder clay which was dumped by Ice Age glaciers. The railway arrived here in 1861. The deep ravine of Skeltenbeck prevented access to the old town, so a new town was created around the station by local entrepreneur Henry Pease, who turned Saltburn into a popular resort. The pier is the only survivor of the six original Yorkshire piers. In its heyday, it was 1,250 feet long, but was cut in half by a boat in 1924. In 1870, a rickety, hoist-like structure was built to carry people between the town and the seafront. In 1883, this was demolished and replaced by the present inclined tramway, or cliff lift. The system uses water ballast. The upper car is weighed with water, and when the brakes are released, it descends, pulling the lighter car up the track. The water is then released at the bottom and pumped back to the top again. The passenger cars, which are mounted on the water tanks, are linked by steel cables.
long before the tourists, Saltburn had another industry, smuggling. Activity was centered on the Ship Inn, where a museum recreates the experiences of its murky past. Hold your tongue. Strangers by the door. They came by land. There's no vessel in the bay. It's all right. John knows of them. They're not clapped to the preventives. Pepper, snuff, white wine, gin, linen, Flemish lace, silk, flax, all deep in duty. So you must see that it lies as our duty to cater to our countrymen's needs that they shall get all these necessities at a fair and just cost. Sit down, friends. Do have a care not to wake me, husband. He's had a long and dangerous night. They'll not catch the king of the smugglers, my own John Andrew. That damn revenue cutter is still coming on. They must have seen our signal light from that now. I'm going to win. Party money rates have on. Keep that on. Saltburn is divided by the Skelton Beck, which has been landscaped to create the Valley Gardens and the Italian Gardens. A delightful miniature railway links the seafront and the gardens, providing a daily service throughout the summer. The 15-inch gauge Prince Charles was introduced in 1953. Diesel powered with a steam outline, she's been giving rides here for over 40 years. Saltburn, the line originally ran all the way to Whitby. Now only a small section survives as a freight line to the potash mine at Bulby. The Riftswood ravine is crossed by the slender pillars of the Skelton Viaduct, a gap of 780 feet. The line then returns to the coast to run along the top of Hunt Cliff, the site of a Roman signal station. These Class 60 locomotives also serve the British Steel Special Products Mill at Skinning Grove. This rolling mill specializes in hot rolled steel sections to individual order. Skinning Grove is also the home to the Tom Leonard Mining Museum which is dedicated to the history of Cleveland's ironstone mining industry. Further along the coast, we come to Bulby Head. These cliffs are 660 feet above sea level, the highest on the east coast. Legend has it 
that Beowulf, the Saxon saga hero, is buried on the cliff top. Below the cliffs are mounds of spoil from ancient potash quarries. Staith's viaduct, now demolished, once continued the line along the coast. Staith's itself is a fishing village, very sheltered and popular with visitors. This is where Captain Cook served as an apprentice before setting off to explore new lands. at Bulby is a freight terminus of the Heritage Coastline. Here, Cleveland Potash has a railway yard where they marshal their salt and potash trains prior to departure. From Saltburn, we return to Middlesbrough in order to take a line which still runs through to Whitby. it's hard to miss all the monuments to Captain Cook. But to find out why, we need to take the Esk Valley line to the suburb of Martin. Martin was the birthplace of Captain Cook, and this is commemorated with a museum in the center of Stuart Park. Among the exhibits are displays of the countries and cultures which he discovered, as well as the two clubs with which he was killed in Hawaii. The museum is surrounded by parkland, an oasis for all kinds of wildlife.
before leaving Martin, there is time for a brief glimpse of Ormsby Hall. The fine 18th century stable block is now leased to the mounted police. Continuing on the Esk Valley line, the railway serves a number of rural villages as it climbs up into the moors. Roseville topping towers above the line. Its hard sandstone cap has withstood even the Ice Age glaciers. Captain Cook again this time at Airy Home Farm, his childhood home on the slopes of Rosebury Topping. Great Ayton is a peaceful little village on a tributary of the River Leven. Captain Cook came to school here. His mother and five of his brothers and sisters are buried by the Church of All Saints, which dates from Saxon times. Captain Cook Heritage Trail is centered on the village. High above, on Easeby Moor, there are paths and trails leading to a 60-foot high obelisk. This was erected to Cook's memory by a local banker. Battersby Station was built in 1858 by the North Yorkshire and Cleveland Railway. This was once a junction with lines to North Allerton and Rosedale. Now it's a dead end and trains must reverse before continuing on to Whitby. The old water tower survives from the days of the North Eastern Railway. They absorbed the North Yorkshire and Cleveland and opened the single track line from Battersby to the ironstone mines in Rosedale. This included an impressive 700 foot climb up the Ingleby Incline onto the plateau of the North York Moors. With a gradient of one in five, wagons had to be hauled up the incline by steel ropes and accidents with runaway wagons were not uncommon. From the top, there are magnificent views across the Cleveland Plain. Northeastern P-class locomotives served on the exposed moor. They lived out their lives here and were lowered down the incline only when the LNER finally abandoned the Rosedale Railway in 1929.
Kildale station serves an estate village which is 900 years old. St. Cuthbert's church can only be approached via a wooden footbridge over the railway. This points to an even earlier history. When the church was rebuilt in 1868, they discovered a pagan burial site here. The Cleveland Way also passes through Kildale. This 100-mile trail was Britain's second official long-distance footpath. The line continues onto the summit before descending into Eskdale. This beautiful valley lies at the heart of the North Yorkshire Moors National Park. Castleton is just one of the many little villages strung out along Eskdale. These were home to the ironstone miners who quarried the raw material for the Middlesbrough ironmasters. Church and chapel are still prominent features of village life, but the Norman castle from which the village takes its name has long since disappeared. This is Yorkshire. Sheep roam the streets and pubs and inns serve traditional Yorkshire ale. Castleton is surrounded by high moors. Farmers have grazed their stock here for thousands of years. Neolithic burial mounds and sacred stones stand silent witness to this ancient landscape. The villages of Danby, Glazedale and Gromont are reached a little further down the Esk Valley line. Danby takes its name from the Danish settlers who arrived here during the Dark Ages. Danby Watermill dates from the 17th century and is the only remaining watermill on the River Esk. The mill, which ground barley for the local farmers and flour for the villagers, also generated electricity.
little bit of this bar. This is crushed barley, actually, for a few people with uh, hens and that, you know, and geese and that. Above the village is a 14th century castle. This has been partially converted into a farmhouse, but was once owned by Catherine Parr, the sixth and surviving wife of Henry VIII. An ancient court still meets here and regulates the gathering of sphagnum moss. Danby is also home to the Moors Centre, where visitors can learn about the landscape and history of the North York Moors National Park. On the other side of Beacon Fell is Scaling Dam. The reservoir is popular for water sports, but part of it has been set aside as a nature reserve. The Esk Valley line is single track, and here at Glazedale, a new line token must be obtained before proceeding to Whitby. Glazedale's 17th century Beggar's Bridge was once the only river crossing for many miles. Two lovers were separated by the unfordable river Esk. The boy went away to seek his fortune, and on his return, he built the bridge and married his sweetheart. The bridge is now popular with walkers, as it connects the ancient pack horse ways which criss-cross the moors. In the village of Gromont, the line crosses the Esk River again. This is the junction with the preserved North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Each year, a weed-killing train travels the entire national network and makes diversions onto adjoining lines. Andrew Barclay, Class 20 diesel locomotives haul the train down to Newtondale. In the yards at Gromont, preparations are underway for the day's passenger duties.
Before taking the steam train to Pickering, there are still two more stations along the Esk Valley line. By the time we reach Rassop, the River Esk has widened and become far more leisurely. Since 1988, this has been home to the Rassop Miniature Railway. Owner Doug Sims has built his own motive power for the seven and a quarter inch gauge line and has converted an unpromising boggy field into a lush setting for his railway. At Whitby, the River Esk runs into the sea at the end of the Esk Valley Line. The town is dominated by a clifftop abbey, which was built in 1220 on the site of an Anglo-Saxon monastery. The abbey fell into ruin in the 16th century, but a modern church has been built alongside. These huge jaw burns proclaim the town's former association with the whaling industry. Captain Cook is remembered too. Today the sheltered harbour is a haven for pleasure craft and small fishing boats. For visitors, there's a choice of excursions and fishing trips, while the quayside is piled high with lobster pots. The town is typical of any small port. Fish is plentiful and the houses are clustered along worn cobbled streets. Whitby also boasts fine beaches, some of the best on the east coast. Whitby was once an important station, and the now closed east coastline served the town. But we must return the way we've come, along the route of the old Whitby and Pickering Railway to Gromont. The line from Whitby to Pickering was built by George Stevenson and an army of navvies between 1833 and 1836. Originally horse-drawn, the railway was soon upgraded for steam, but was finally forced to close in 1967. In 1973, the route was reopened as a preserved steam line, operated by the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Number five, a Lambton Hetman Joyce colliery engine, built by Stevenson in 1909, prepares to depart from Gromont.
After crossing the Merck Esk River, the train plunges into Gromont Tunnel. Beyond the tunnel, the railway is 18 miles long and serves three other stations en route to Pickering. At 1 in 49, the gradient between Gromont and Gothland is one of the steepest in the country. Until 1865, this section was originally a rope-worked incline. The river is crossed several times, and at Darnholm, sleepy meadows provide an ideal picnic spot. Number five pulls into Gothland. The station is typical of the Northeastern Railway and has changed little since it was opened in 1865. The village of Gothland is a typical North Yorkshire community, well known to millions as the village of Aidensfield in the TV series Heartbeat. The pace of life is still unhurried and sheep are allowed to graze freely between the sturdy stone houses. Behind the village, a stream plunges down to join the river. This is Malian Spout, one of the area's most delightful waterfalls. we join Dame Vera Lynn, a massive war department class 210, built in 1943. She served in Egypt and Greece before repatriation in 1984. now crosses open moorland. This is number 80135, a British Rail 264 tank engine built in 1956. Number five returns over the summit. Here on the highest point of the moor, there were once three giant golf balls. They've recently been replaced by a single giant pyramid, all part of the Fighting Dale's early warning defense system. Great Western tank engine heads down into Newtondale. Further along, we pick up number 841, a Southern Railway S1510 wheeler. The Newtondale Gorge was formed at the end of the last ice age, some 10,000 years ago. 
a huge lake of meltwater bursts through from Eskdale and carved a trench 14 miles long and 400 feet deep. After the Ice Age, woodland appeared, and when the trees died, they formed peat. Today, the area is known as Fen Bog. The peat is almost 40 feet deep and caused serious problems for the railway builders. Beyond Carter's House ruin lies Newtondale Halt. From a high vantage point in Cropton Forest, the magnificent splendor of Newtondale is laid out before us. The station is accessible only by rail, but passengers are provided with a network of forest paths, and walkers are often surprised at what they find here. Further down the gorge is number 901, a northeastern Q7 freight engine built in 1919. Once, this was Cleveland's most southerly ironstone mine. On the cliff above is Skelton Tower, built in 1850 by our local rector as a quiet retreat in which to write his sermons. West Country Pacific, Tor Valley, coasts into Levisham Station. The station serves two villages on opposite sides of the railway, both some 300 feet above the valley floor. Levisham has its roots in heavy industry. The village had a forge in 1207, and a unique Iron Age bloomery has also been discovered here. signal box at Newbridge controls the road gates as well as all the signaling for Pickering Station, still over half a mile away. Pickering and the end of the line as number five pulls into the station.
Pickering is a busy market town. Stone buildings climb up from the river and high on the hill stands Pickering Castle, founded by William the Conqueror in the 11th century. This was originally a timber fort, but defences were strengthened following raids by Robert the Bruce of Scotland. Almost every king of medieval England is said to have stayed here. Also worth a visit is the Beck Isle Museum of Rural Life. Back at the station, there's time for one final trip on Eric Treacy, an LMS Black Five named after a bishop, as we return to Gromont.